New coronavirus infections have soared to record highs in six American states, including the three most populous states, Texas, California, and Florida. The governor of California, Gavin Newsom, is pleading with his residents to take precautions. Our next guest, DJ Patil, has written a report on lessons learned to get ready for the next wave. He became America's first chief data scientist under President Obama. And he's currently head of technology for a healthcare company, but he's taking unpaid leave to help California fight the pandemic. And here he is talking to our Hari Srinivasan about how crunching the numbers will be key to mitigating this virus. Thanks, Christian. DJ Patil, welcome. Uh, you have been volunteering with the state of California and you've been consulting with other state governments over the past three months trying to help them tackle the data around COVID. What have you learned so far? Well, the, the fascinating thing is that the number of people that have all come to work on COVID problems, this is just such a unique period of time. And the governments need new technologists, they need data people, they need all the help that they can get. Really what I've taken away from this effort is, is that we're one at the very beginning early on in COVID, two is, that as we think about how to manage COVID into this next phase, we really need drastic new approaches. And much of that is the need to be data-driven. And we're seeing this happen in companies, we're seeing this happen in so many different sectors, but it's how do we use data in novel ways to, to really power the next wave of the response? You took a leave of absence from your current job to, to work with the state of California, why? Well, uh, but the company that I work for is called Devoted Health, and we're responsible for more than 17,000 senior citizens. And when I watch what's happening with COVID, as, as we watch for our, our population, it's very clear that they're in the bullseye. And we need to do everything that we possibly can. And as we're working to safeguard and make sure that they're, they're getting everything they need, it was very clear that not enough was happening at the state level. Uh, or the federal level. And so as we thought about it, and we thought what's the most useful thing that I could do with my time would be to help the state and, and help by helping California with 40 million people, we would develop uh, systems and ideas that would then go to other states that would then help our population. Because COVID doesn't frankly care about geographic boundaries as we know. So the the, the idea is really to kind of help lift up the entire system to support our population as well as everyone else's. Now, we're seeing numbers in California start to track back up. Did they do something wrong? I think what we're finding is, once again, the part about that we're early in COVID and trying to understand what's happening. Two is opening up the economy has consequences. Not everyone opens up safely. We've had groups where you know people go out to restaurants and bars and they're really close in proximity and they're not taking COVID seriously. And we're starting to hear those stories where you know, a, friend, a group of friends went, and a big percentage of them all came down with COVID. We're also seeing this limits of what different counties and approaches can do. So you can have one county that says, we're not gonna take COVID seriously. We may think of it as a hoax. Well, we're not gonna enforce masks we see other places where they take it very seriously. One of the interesting things is why is San Francisco Bay Area doing better than LA? And in and, and that first run up for, for watching what COVID was, was having the impact on, on, on the US, one of the things that was seen for, particularly if you look at restaurant data receipts, is seven to 10 days before the, the state home orders were put in place, People already had stopped going to restaurants. People just said, look, this isn't safe. They decided themselves rather than having someone decide for them. Other parts of California, LA included, have not or did not have that effort. Also, the industry, the tech community, largely said workers stay home. So the Bay Area was already largely sheltering in place for a certain portion of the population. And that dramatically helped things out. So what, is, what do we need to do next of that is, is, is learn from one county to another. And luckily the mayors of, of the cities are actually starting to share that. But this also comes down this aspect of 
the more we attack the public health care officials, the less chance we have to actually getting these lessons learned to implement. Are you hearing that frustration from the public health officials, the mayors, the county commissioners that you're talking to and working with right now? Well, the, the place I hear it the most is from the, the, the public health officials who are all questioning whether this is worth it. And that those are the worst and saddest calls I have because we need them. And they're saying, look, I'm in this conversation with my county supervisors and they're, they're not listening to me. I'm getting death threats and no one's standing up for me. And that, that is just, you know, it just erodes them over time. It just, they just can't take it anymore. We're starting to see resignation start to take place. And unfortunately, I expect a number of more resignations, not just across the states, but the state of California, but across the country as, as a result. Why, you know, on the modeling end of things, was it so difficult or is it so difficult to figure out where our resources are necessary? On the one hand, you had requests for ventilators that were unnecessary. On the other hand, you had PPP falling short where it should not have, right? And in this climate, each of these failings ends up getting weaponized because of the politics of the day. Much of the data that we have relied upon for models is really data that is critically shared between countries. A lot of that is brokered by the WHO, the World Health Organization. It's actually why it's so important to remain part of these organizations because that's how we share and collaborate. The way to think about models is this is the early days in many ways parallel to weather forecasting. Imagine we had weather models, but we didn't really have weather balloons or planes or satellites. And we just had a few people going outside and sticking the finger in the wind saying, yep, the wind's blowing to the south today. We don't have a sensory network. We don't have models that are very sophisticated and running on supercomputers like we'd like to think. These models are rather simplistic. Uh, some of the models just try to fit curves and try to figure out how to, the line best looks to the data. Others try to model the dynamics, which are known as mechanistic models. But the thing that's there, and this was called for when I was in the Bush administration, and it's been continuously called on, is that we don't have a national center for disease forecasting. We don't have a collective effort. It's actually two things. One, we don't have a good way of capturing data, getting data, and that's through large-scale testing, this electronic testing, the documents being fully, fully digital and moved around in an appropriate way, uh, and, and getting that foundation of data. The second is we don't share. We're not sharing enough of our results. We're not opening up our, our data to collaborate, moving things around. The, the, during the Obama administration, we had a very strong push to make sure all data by default is open and machine readable. The more states open up the data, the better the quality of modeling will be. So what would you tell the president now about this? Uh, COVID is real, it's early, it's not gonna go away anytime soon, and it's gonna need the full force of every aspect of what we have as the United States to tackle this. And every day that we move forward without tackling this is an increase in cost of life and economics. We have the ability to both lose the public health war and the economics war if we're not careful. And both are, are tragedies. It's, you know, it's unbelievable that we're talking about, you know, close to, uh, well, well past 100,000 lives, you know, getting to 120,000. We're seeing estimates getting up there by October in the 180,000 to 200,000 range. Uh, it's important to remember that everyone, these data points have names, they're loved ones, and they're disproportionately impacting Blacks and, and people of uh, Indigenous uh, origin. Uh, so we got to get ahead of that. And, and the part that that's going to need is to some very classic things. One is we all have to be on the same page together. We have to act as a unified force. And that means doing simple things like wearing a mask. I wear the mask not because I'm protecting myself, but because I want to protect you. I want to be a good responsible citizen. Two, we need to really think about what does it mean to protect the vulnerable. Third, how do we get the infrastructure in place knowing that COVID 
is going to be here for a while. And frankly, COVID isn't the big one. We have to get ready for a pandemic that is far more virulent because of uh, a pandemic influenza or new diseases that are going to be showing up. Uh, we have to get that infrastructure, and it takes time to get that infrastructure. So start laying the tracks down now. And then finally, come to the defense of the public health official. It's not just public health officials like, like, um, like Fauci, but all the local public health officials, Amy Acton in Ohio or others, and start encouraging data scientists and technologists to jump in and take their skills to bring it to governments, to the local county levels to help support the, the, the system in new novel ways. How would you rate the responses that we've had on perhaps on a California scale that you've been looking at closely, but also on a federal level? Well, like the state level is has been one where I think what we've found is everyone is kind of swarming to the problem. What I think we did very effectively as a nation in many of the states has been collectively to get to, to flatten the curve, which was to really shelter in place and stay at home. Why is that so critical? We needed to buy time for our healthcare system to catch up, to get the beds in place, to get the, the protective gear in place, to start getting testing in place, to, to put all those things in. We've had to get testing ramped up across you know, the drive throughs How do we enable that to be better? What we haven't done is accelerated that even more. There's still testing that's going on, but how do we make sure that it's used we still have challenges of use. We still haven't seen this idea of contact tracing, which is once somebody's infected, how to find all the other people who might've been impacted. How do we get that collectively rolled out? And we need much more of that happening at, at the state level. At the federal level, it, we just haven't seen a cohesive movement. And we've seen this, this argument just to make it the state's problems and then the states aren't prepared. And so they make it the county problems. And, and the counties are trying to just figure out how to do this with very uh, threadbare budgets. So we, we need a more collective strategy and, and a recognition that we have to have a strategy as a nation that is going to, uh, uh, to, to work on this rather than, you know, the county to my north and me having a different strategy from the county to the south. Of me. We, everyone has to be in it together. We've also got a, a culture of denialism here. I mean, we've got not only people who are actively saying that this is fading away, this is uh, that we've won this fight already, um, but that's having consequences when people are going to restaurants and as a nation, we're collectively seeing that flattening of the curve kind of come back up. We're already seeing this, the rise of the cases. The cases are already starting to go up. What we still, do, and this shows like we saw how, how our early our understanding of COVID is, is why does it go up so fast in certain places and not as much in others? One of the challenges, and we've seen this really in, a, in, a, in an unfortunate way, we've seen in states like Arizona where they said, you know, to the team of modelers that have been, uh, that have been supporting them, thanks, but no thanks. Uh, we don't need you anymore because we got this under control. The latest data shows they clearly have not. Uh, they clearly do not. And luckily, thanks to public pressure, that they have brought those modelers back in to support them. But we've also seen data scientists in Florida who've been, a, but work for the Florida government, who've been under attack for reporting flaws of the data or inaccuracies. Or in Georgia, even the way they presented the data makes it misleading. The data is about having a conversation it's an it's an honest thing and is it is it feel good when those cases go up and you look at it no it's not supposed to feel good what's supposed to do is help us figure out what are we going to do next and just turning a blind eye to the data and as you said you can't fix what you can't measure we have to have this as a, as a truly data and science driven approach and, and it's about acceleration of our understanding you recently wrote about kind of the intersection of the protests and COVID. Tell us about that. Well, this this actually, as we think about the protests and COVID, one of the things that I, that, that I think we, we need to really be asking about 
is what does it look like for us to really understand the roots of the protest? And that, that's, that's, that is fundamentally how we police. How do we actually structurally measure these pieces of, of the problem? There are so many times when a very basic question is asked by a police chief, a mayor, a governor, something simple, like what's the, what percentage of, of, of the population who has stopped are black versus another, another population? And the number of times the answer is, we don't know because we can't get that information. I hear that all the time on COVID. I don't know, we can't get that information. And it's unbelievable that in this day and age, we're not willing to go to the effort or the lengths to go get that information to do this. I'm also very concerned about the use of data and uh, creating a surveillance state and making sure that data is used responsibly. There's an incredible amount of technology that's being used for, for uh, facial recognition. We know that there's issues of bias in there. Police departments have access to this technology. Uh, and they're using it in other ways. Some to identify people who are not peaceful protesters, but there's a question of where does that data go? Who has oversight to it? And what if somebody is you know, wrongly accused of something or that's not them? And how do they clear their name? And we've seen this happen time and time again. And we should take the lessons that we've learned from how we've built these systems and where we've done it well and where we haven't after 9-11 and really figure out what does it look like to start putting these new systems together and, and, and doing it in a responsible way. DJ Patil, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you.